Six. Four. Three. Two. Zero. And lift off. I would like to encourage you all to pull out that note sheet that's in your info packet. And if you're not a paper and pen type of person, we got a PDF. That PDF is located on the home page of the website. You can also access it at the messages tab of the church app. So you have two options, paper or PDF. You know, I love being in prayerful contemplation on a regular basis. It's such an incredible experience to just be in the Lord's presence and to receive direction from him, especially regarding Sunday mornings. And he planted this question in my mind that I thought was really quite profound. I have it on the screen for you. If Mary is the mother of Jesus and Jesus is the Lamb of God, does that mean Mary had a little lamb? <laughs> Amen. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Praise the Lord. Well, I got a few chuckles from some of you, and that really blesses my heart. And I um, would like you all now to turn to John chapter 4. That's roughly seven eighths to fifteen sixteenths of the way through your bible if you're in luke mark matthew malachi zechariah you're a little too far to the left acts romans first corinthians a little bit too far to the right once again gospel of john chapter four we're continuing our series titled for god so loved the world a series through john you know as i was preparing this message I came across this really interesting song that was released in 2003, an artist named Stacy Orico. The title of the song is, There's Gotta Be More to Life. These words were so profound to me that I copied and pasted it on your note sheet. Please follow along as I read the lyrics. It starts with the intro, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. And then going into verse 1, I've got it all, but I feel so deprived. I go up, I come down, and I'm emptier inside. Tell me, what is this thing that I feel like I'm missing? I'll repeat that. Tell me, what is this thing that I feel like I'm missing? Why can I not let it go? There's got to be more to life than chasing down every temporary high to satisfy me. Because the more that I'm tripping out, thinking there must be more to life, well, it's life, but I'm sure there's got to be more than wanting more. And verse 2 says, I've got the time and I'm wasting it slowly. Here in this moment, I'm halfway out the door on to the next thing. I'm searching for something that's missing. I'll repeat that. I'm searching for something that's missing. I find it really interesting that that song made number 30 in the top 100 billboard in 2003. It must have really resonated with at least the 360 million people in our country. Well, why would it resonate with us? Because it addresses the internal crisis of looking for something that will fill the void. Because we're all born with a sin nature, and also because we're born 
to be fulfilled truly in God alone, we're born with a void, a hole in our hearts, if you will. And we will attempt to fill it in all different kinds of ways, like the way that the songwriter had wrote about. So what do we end up being? Disappointed, disillusioned, dissatisfied. It's like, for some of us, perhaps we can relate to the historical version of the American dream, right? You graduate from high school, you either go to college or the military or a trade school. You're entering in the career of your choice. You're building that career. You get married, you have kids, you buy this little house with a white picket fence and a dog named Rover. And then you're still waking up thinking there's got to be more to life than this. Or maybe your version is totally different. Maybe you're really attracted to traveling the world and you travel to all types of different countries and learning different cultures and you're thinking, wow, this is awesome. But there's still something missing. I don't get it. I'm doing what I've always dreamed about doing and there's got to be more to life. Or maybe some will pursue the dream of being a successful musician, actor, or athlete. And they, they get that college scholarship and they move on to semi-pro or pro. And they're living the dream. But are they really living the dream? It's like they still have that gnawing feeling. They're empty. There's a void that is not being filled. So here's my response to all of this. A question for all of you. Can you relate to that statement? There's got to be more to life. Now, for those of us who are sanctified believers in Jesus and have been walking with him for a while, we don't relate to that anymore. But we used to. We know what that was like. In fact, it was that very void that, that caused us to hunger for God himself. And then the hunger was satisfied. Like Jesus said in John 10 and verse 10, I came that the whole world may have life and that to the full. You're either having life to the full or not to the full. It's one or the other, right? Full is full and to not be full is to not be full. So this is a really exciting thing that I'm going to share with you at this point. In our main passage, Jesus answers this predicament in an uncommon way. Applying personally his passage, or his answer, will either, number one, bring you to a place of never relating to that statement again, or two, equip you to help others get to that place. So for us veteran Christians, yeah, we're at that place and we're no longer searching, right? We're whole, we're complete. We don't relate to that. But you can be further equipped to help others who are not there yet. So you're either in one camp or the other. And I'm excited about what the Lord has to teach us regarding this. So I'll give you one more opportunity to turn to John chapter 4 while I pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this awesome moment. You've prepared our hearts and minds to learn some breathtaking truths in your word. May we also learn how to apply them. May that come with a great Holy Spirit conviction to help others get to that place where they can no longer relate to the statement, the universal statement, there's got to be more to life. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to begin in verse 31, and we're going to read through verse 42. I'll provide a little bit of commentary as we read through, and then we'll go from there. The first thing I need to do is provide a little bit of background. I want you all to imagine being one of the disciples, and you're en route back to the well where Jesus and the Samaritan woman are. Now, prior to that, Jesus and the woman had this absolutely incredible dialogue that caused her to miraculously be transformed 
from a sinful woman with a sinful reputation in her town, a broken woman to a completely transformed woman. And the woman and Jesus are there at the well. You're one of the disciples. You're walking towards the well, and you're pretty stunned that Jesus is actually talking to this woman because in that culture, that wasn't an acceptable thing, especially a pure-blood Jew talking with a half-breed sinful woman. So in verse 27, we see that the disciples return. They're surprised to find him talking with a woman. But they're in a state of awe because they're there in the presence of God incarnate, right? God veiled in flesh, bone, and blood. And they're like, not even going to ask him, why are you talking with her? And then you, as one of the disciples, you see the woman leave. She's filled with joy. She's radiant. She's walking back to the town where she's from. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. And the incredible response that the town had was that they came to Jesus. You see that in verse 30? They're coming out of the town. They're making their way toward him. So, meantime, you're one of the disciples. She's left, and the disciples are urging him, Rabbi, eat something. And he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. The disciples didn't get it, of course. They, they're, they're saying to themselves, could someone have brought him food? Jesus is like, no, I'm saying this in a completely different context here. Awesome teaching moment. Here we go. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then he launches into this really interesting analogy of a physical crop. Like, we're familiar with corn or whatever types of crops that are grown in a field. And he says, guys, you all know the season that we're in right now. It's four months until the harvest. Well, I tell you this. He switches. Guys, he goes from the physical. He's saying, yeah, four months until the harvest, right? Well, now I'm going to talk about something spiritual. Open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. That's the saying. One sows, another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done, you know, like John the Baptist and the Old Testament prophets. They've done the hard work. They did a lot of the sowing. Uh, you have reaped the benefits of their labor by reaping the harvest. Wow, how amazing to think about. Now the scene changes in verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town, that town comprised of a people that were despised by the Jews, which, by the way, wow, Jesus loved them so much that he took a detour on his way to Galilee to go to Samaria because he desired for the kingdom of God to advance in that region. And many of them from that town believed, everyone say believed, in Jesus. Why? Because of the woman's testimony. This woman, she'd be the last person on earth they would want to hear about the good news of Jesus. Because she was despised, rejected in her town. She comes as a new woman, and they're amazed, and they believe because of her testimony, quote, he told me everything I ever did, unquote. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, he stayed, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. Listen to this. Because of his words, many more became believers. Everyone say believers. So now the Samaritans, they said to the woman, we no longer believe, everyone say believe, just because of what you said, 
Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the, brace yourselves, the Savior of the world. That's incredible. That proclamation is really something else. It's, it's a miracle that they had that revelation. That was from God himself revealing that to them. So with all of this said, I'm going to begin with a few takeaways here. The first one is found in verses 32 and 33. If your eyes are there, say amen. Verse 32, so interesting. I'll set it up. The disciples are saying, Rabbi, eat something. He says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. His disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm sure that when Jesus said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about, he really wants them to get it, right? But when he said that, and then their response was such that they did not get it, I'm sure Jesus began his teaching with a heavy sigh. Because in that very moment, a harvest from the region of Samaria is about to be reaped. How interesting. Jesus had this incredible dialogue with this woman, and she became transformed, and then she was sent off by him to witness to her people. We're talking about a harvest here in Samaria. We all know this is a spiritual harvest, right? A harvest of souls. And Jesus, I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't think of any greater joy than to experience people becoming born again and people's lives transformed and where they lived a sinful life, they now as new creatures live a life pleasing to God and filled with hope and joy and peace and a sense of eternal mission. I can't personally think of a greater joy that I personally have. When that happens, man, I live for that kind of stuff. That's, that's really amazing. So here Jesus is sending off the woman and it, they're responding to her witness. And he's like, harvest, it's harvest. Harvest is happening right now. It's happening throughout that whole region of Samaria. And he's like, oh man, disciples, do I ever want you to get this? He so desired for them to get it. <laughs> But they didn't get it, not right away anyway, they will later. But that's God's heart, everyone. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, us Bible scholars have memorized this. God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. How about emphasizing those words? He wants all people to come to the knowledge of truth the truth. The specific truth that I'm talking about here is that of the born again experienced in a field of souls. That of the kingdom of God expanding in a field of souls. The kingdom of God, Romans chapter 14 teaches, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's only made possible through unconditional surrender to Jesus, right? And imagine that in an entire field, a whole bunch of people experiencing revival. Revival. That's what happened in, or I should say, actually, now that I really think about it, vival. Samaria experienced vival because revival is, right, d definitively speaking, something that was vived in the past and now is revived, right? They had revival. <laughs> oh my goodness. See, I get happy just thinking about it, just talking about it, man. The very first time ever that this region had experienced the kingdom of God expanding. It's just awesome. So he wanted his disciples to get it, that's for sure. It's God's heart. Come to the knowledge of this particular truth, yeah. Well, let's move on to verses 34 through 38 for our second takeaway. If your eyes are at verse 34, say amen. 
Verse 34 through 38, wow. Jesus breaks it down for them. He's like, okay, teaching moment here, teaching moment. Look, what I meant to say when I said I have food to eat that you know nothing about is not in the physical. It's kind of interesting to think about, right? We have fields that various crops are grown in, and when harvest time comes, we, we, our tummies are full. We're not hungry, right? He's talking in the spiritual. They didn't get it yet, but he's going to go into it here. And that's a spiritual harvest of souls that by being touched by the Lord Jesus and becoming born again, never hunger again. Filled, satisfied, ultimately no longer relating to the universal statement. There's got to be more to life. Wow. So verses 34 through 38. Jesus first, he explains what he means by food. He says, no, no, it's, it's not like physical food, guys. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And what was the work that we, he was currently involved with? Samaria. That was his work, right? He, he he uh, commissioned the Samaritan woman to play a, an integral role in that. And he's saying now, okay, you, I want to make sure you get this, disciples. You all know about four months more, and we got the harvest coming up, right? I'm telling you, open your spiritual eyes. Look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. The field of souls. My goodness, guys. That's what's happening in Samaria as we speak. The Samaritans are listening to the woman's testimony. And they say that they believe in him because of her testimony. That's happening right now, disciples. Even now, the reaper draws his wages. He harvests the crop for eternal life. Wow. Wow. So Jesus, again, he explains what he means by food. And then from verse 35 and on, he explains what the will of God the Father is all about. The will of God. Think about that, guys. I don't know about you, but there have been often times in my past where I thought, God, what's your will regarding this particular season that I'm in or this tough predicament that I find myself in. What's your will? Should I go left? Should I go right? He's not talking about that type of will. That's a different type of God's will. He's talking about the revealed will of God, that which we can learn about in his word. It's, in other words, revealed in his word. That's what I'm talking about here. And Jesus is explaining what the will of God the Father is all about. Here it is. Brace yourselves. Here we go. For Jesus and the 12 disciples and the disciples throughout all the millennia, all over the world, for the last 2,000 years, all the way up to us disciples. The will of God is this, to work in our field of souls. You see that in the main passage? Jesus is talking about, like, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Well, the will of God, our food, is to do the will of God who saved us. And it's the same. It's the same mission. The propagation of the gospel in our backyards and in our city and our county and our state and the United States and the whole world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's the will of God for us as well. And this is how we no longer relate to that universal statement, there's got to be more to life. We find our everything, the very reason why God put us on this earth, and the reason why he rescued us was to rescue others through us. 
And you can confidently say, my reality is that I'm no longer wanting for anything else in this life. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. But prior to that, when we used to say, yeah, there's got to be something more alive. I'm missing something. I don't know what it is. Well, everything minus Jesus equals nothing. Yeah, you can fulfill the American dream. You could be a professional athlete or you could travel the world or whatever it is that you really thought would give you ultimate satisfaction. And you go, I got everything minus Jesus. It equals nothing. But when I had that radical, radical encounter with him and he saved me and he rescued me, now it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And, and it's just indescribably glorious. I can't... Love talking about this stuff, man. <laughs> it, it's, it's amazing. Okay, so that, if you're not where I am by the grace of God, it's his will that you be there. Like it said again, 1 Timothy 2, he wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of this truth. And please understand, for many, it's a process. Even after being saved and even doing great things for God, you could still find yourself in a season where it's like, there's got to be more. But he is faithful. He will bring you to that place. And you'll never, ever relate again to the statement, there's got to be more to life. So, I, I'm feeling like you guys are saying in your hearts, tell me more. Oh, sure. But first, let's look at a bunch of people who can no longer relate to the statement, there's got to be more to life. Put your eyes on verse 39. Who are these bunch of people I'm talking about? The Samaritans. Oh, man. That sinful woman, who was no longer a sinful woman, because of her radical encounter with Jesus, and she was transformed and became a new creature, the old has passed and the new had come. She died to her sins, and she came back into that town with boldness, as a witness. Those Samaritans, they believed in him just because of her testimony. He told me everything I ever... That's a God thing, right? Wow. But then... The Samaritans came to him. They urged him to stay with them. He stays two days. Because of his words, many more become believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. In other words, yeah, we believe because of what you said. But now, not just because of that, but wow, we heard for ourselves. We know that this man really is the savior of the world. Mind blown. This is really interesting that I talked about how the will of God is to work in our field of souls. Okay, we all have different fields of souls, okay? Your workplace is a field. You know, the, the, the social club, if you're a part of a club of some sort or meetings, that's a field of souls. The sport that your kid is involved in and the various activities in that arena, that is a field of souls. And, and yeah, the will of God, the work that we do in this specific context is a work that field to sow and to reap. And The very, very first work, though, if you look at those couple of verses that I just read, the word believe or believers is repeated three times. The very first work that you do when you're a newborn babe just out of the womb, and you're, you're like, I'm talking in a spiritual sense, born again, you're a spiritual babe in Christ, and the very first work that happened was that you believed. Yeah, see, you could ask people who don't know the Bible very well, you, are you familiar with Christianity and how Christians go to heaven? 
And a lot of people was, and you could ask them, what do you, what do you think? They, oh, oh, you believe. No, that's not how you get saved. It's by grace. It is by grace that you are saved. If you believe, that is something that is from you. That is a, a, an action. And that is a work. But the only way that you were actually able to do that very first work was because God, in his sovereign grace at the appointed day and the appointed time, gave you the capacity. He enabled you to be able to perform your very first work, believing. And I'll support that with John chapter 6 and Jesus' very own words. He had fed thousands of people and then him and the disciples went across the lake and all those people are like, ah, clamoring to, to, to get to him and they all work their way around in the lake. And he is telling them, don't work for food that spoils. Because, you know, I just fed your bellies with this miraculous feeding. Don't, don't work for that, but for food that endures to eternal life. So it goes from the physical to the spiritual in one breath, right? Don't work for that food of spoils that you just got fed with. Don't, but, spiritual, food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, that's himself, will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Listen to this. Then they ask him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Like, just give me a list of things that I'm supposed to do so I could feel like I'm in good standing with God and we'll go to heaven. You know what Jesus says? The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. That's it. So my point is this. Is Jesus taught that our very first work is to believe. And the only way we could do that was because he enabled us to do so. Wow. And this leads to other works. Like, for example, working in a field. A field of souls, that is, right? Yeah. So, this is really amazing. So, what do I do with what I just learned here, Pastor? I'm really glad that you're asking that question, too, because James 1 says, be a doer of the word. Be a doer and not a hearer only, deceiving yourselves. Listen, if you're not doing the works that God commands you to do, his word, that believing was not with a dynamic faith that truly saves. A faith that truly, truly saves results in a changed life. It results in sooner or later you recalibrating your life to that being in alignment with a biblical Christian worldview. So your, your, your values change, uh, your beliefs change. All kinds of things are changing. I mean, your whole life is changing now. And you just want to be a doer of the word. You know, it's not, it's like you have that desire to be that way. Uh, there are some great evidences of the truly born again experience. So all of that said, I'll answer your question. What do you do? What do you do with what you just learned? First things first. You must be born again. You must be born again. Where did I get that terminology from? Jesus in John chapter 3, the famous interaction with Nicodemus. <laughs> Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And Nicodemus properly answers, how can a man be born when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God. Look, we're in the midst of the kingdom of God, okay? Um, if you're born again, you're a citizen of the kingdom of God and you're, you're partaking of all the wonderful realities of the kingdom of God, right? And then if anyone is not born again, then you have not entered the kingdom of God. 
Because that's what Jesus says right here. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, right? Like we were born out of our mother's womb. And Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, gives birth to Spirit. Don't be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So that's the first step. And what's a tangible way to complete this first step? It's really, really simple. You just say a prayer. That's all. If you say a prayer with a humble and contrite heart, sincerity, acknowledging your need to be rescued from your sins, and acknowledging that Jesus is eternal God that traveled into time to be born into this world as a perfect man and become the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. You believe that with a childlike faith and you ask him into your heart. You're born again. Why don't we just say a prayer? Because I want to make sure 100% everybody is born again in this room and watching online. So. Please repeat after me out loud, dear Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I accept your free offer of forgiveness. Make me born again. I invite you into my heart and my life. Teach me your will and your ways. From this day forward, I am unconditionally devoted to you. Thank you for saving me. In your name I pray. Amen. Can we give the Lord some claps? <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's really that simple, guys. Okay, so... That's bullet point one on first things first. You must be born again. Bullet point two, know that you were born again to do good works. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For us Bible scholars, we know verses 8 and 9, we have that memorized. It's by grace that you're saved. It enables you to exercise faith. This is not from yourselves. This is a gift of God. It's not by works. You can't earn this salvation. You can't earn this forgiveness of your sins. So you won't be able to boast. <laughs> Here's verse 10. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared us in advance to do. In the context of the passage here, the good work of being workers in a field of souls, right? Your workplace, your neighborhood, wherever it may be. The third bullet point, our main passage is describing the work of God in the context of witnessing. That's what I mean when I'm talking about being a worker in a field of souls. I'm talking about us being effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus. What is a witness? A witness is someone who testifies in a court of law as to what he has seen, heard, experienced. So it's an apt word to describe us as witnesses of what we've experienced in the Lord Jesus. And we're called to, to witness to this world. And by the way, this is how Christianity has been propagated throughout the whole world for the last 2,000 years. This is God's plan A. There is no plan B. He established the Ecclesia Church on the earth to advance his kingdom. How is that done? Being witnesses. That's how it's done. So Acts 1 and verse 8 says, You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So to be a bold witness is a big deal. It's a really big deal, right? It's eternally big. It's universally big. This is God's rescue plan 
for all of humanity. Wow, we get to partake in that plan. See, this is why we can no longer relate to the universal statement, there's got to be more to life. So, in um, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, brace yourselves, Jesus' words, this is a, supporting the statement, it's a really, really big deal. He says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. It's a really big deal. 2 Corinthians 5, I love the Apostle Paul's uh, take on this. He says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He committed to all of us a message of reconciliation. When I say reconciliation, think brought into harmony. We've been reconciled to God, made one with God, brought into harmony with God. How? By grace through faith. Well, how do we know that to be true in our lives? We're doing the works that he commands us to do. We're living lives that are pleasing to him and so on. Okay, so, so we have a message of reconciliation. He's committed that to all of us individually. We are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And that's exactly what happens. The Spirit of God dwells inside of us, and when we are witnessing, he is making his appeal through us to that unsaved person, be reconciled to God, be brought into harmony with God through faith in Jesus. So, I have four final points here in regards to application. I want to set the scene. Can somebody tell me, their, just shout out their favorite sport? Hockey. Hockey. Wow. That's your favorite sport. That's awesome. All right. So, imagine you're a parent or a guardian or a grandparent or an uncle and you you have a child who's interested in hockey they join the you know the youth hockey team and the community oh another field of souls you're you're supporting the team you support the coach you're you're going to the games of course to watch your kid play hockey and you're just so proud of your kid and you're getting to know the other parents or guardians and you, it's so easy to talk with them about, oh man, is that your kid? The number 82 jersey, wow, he just scored. That's so awesome, way to go, you know. And maybe the ref makes a bad call and you're both like, ah, right? Well, how hard is it though to witness alongside those other parents or guardians. Why is it hard to do this? Well, there's spiritual warfare involved. You shouldn't really expect it to be easy. But the enemy on your way to the game, he may try and distract you, get you like frustrated about some issue in your life. Uh, now you're not effective, right? So maybe you're distracted or maybe you're even kind of afraid to, to like share Jesus because you're gonna get rejected. Um, yeah, that's par for the course, actually. But if we don't experience rejection here and there, then we're not being bold witnesses. So again, it's really easy to talk with the other parents about, about how the team's doing, about how bad the coach is and the weather, and so on and so forth. It's tough to include Jesus, let's be real. We'd much rather take the, the easy way, right? Let's just have fun. And uh, rather than going against the grain, right? Or against the current. So it could be the, 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 the hockey game or it could be the workplace or the gym or the social club, whatever it is. You desire to talk with people about God. Well, first you should talk to God about people. In other words, we should pray 
Okay, that's the first big tip that I have for you guys in regards to doing work in your field of souls, being a bold witness. Pray. Colossians 4, verses 2 through 4. This is really an interesting supporting passage here. It says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, Paul the Apostle said to the church in Thessalonica. Pray for me and my missionary team too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. In other words, the good news message, the gospel, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So we have a multifaceted supporting verse here. We're, we're to pray for one another, to be bold witnesses. We're to pray for our, our unsaved oikos network, family, friends, relatives, co-workers, neighbors, schoolmates. We're to pray for other people who have been called into the mission field and for our next backyard missions team. Uh, if you're not on the team, play a vital role in, in praying for our team the next time we go out. You get the point. We've got to pray. Okay, here's the second big tip regarding being a bold witness. Be a peculiar person by being like Jesus. Where did I get those words? It's from 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. In the King James Version, I love that term, peculiar people. You are a chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, a peculiar people. Why? To declare the praises of him who called you out of a kingdom of darkness and into a kingdom of light. As ambassadors, we are citizens of a kingdom of light. And we are in the midst of a kingdom of darkness. We're in the world, but not of the world. We're called as ambassadors to proclaim the message of reconciliation. Forgiveness of sins is offered, and you can be in harmony with the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all things, by placing dynamic faith in Jesus. So be a peculiar person. Okay, what does that mean? It means you're like Jesus. Like, you know, those famous bracelets, what would Jesus do? Or hey, how would Jesus behave? HWJB, I'm gonna create a new one. HWJB, how would Jesus behave? I'm like this really passionate hockey fan because my kid's on the team and the, the coach made a bad call and the guy beside me, what the? And I'm joining him and I'm like, ah. I'm no different than the world, <laughs> right? Getting all bent out of shape, wanting to beat up the, the, the referee's bad call. No, we're called to be a peculiar people. We're called to stand out because we love Jesus and we want to be like him. We want to behave the way that he would behave in that situation. Now, what does that do? That leads me to tip number three. It opens the door to include Jesus in daily conversations. Like every single day we wake up, we should think, I want to try and include Jesus in every conversation I have. Somehow, some way, it doesn't necessarily need to be like, Jesus loves you and he died on the cross for your sins. It could be, hey, I'm going to a uh, Christmas Eve special service you should come with. Boom, there it is, right? It's really that simple. Or you could be talking about your kid and, and you can say, yeah, man, I'm really proud of my kid because last Sunday he learned about this at church. Boom, there it is. It's, it's that simple. Now, we have our first tip to pray for our unsaved people. The second tip, be a proper representative of the kingdom of God in the world. In other words, be a peculiar person, right? by being like Jesus. Three, include Jesus in daily conversations. The fourth and final one, don't forget to invite them to discipleship. Because this, that's different than witnessing, right? Witnessing is, the, is, is leading someone to this point of unconditional surrender to Jesus and becoming born again. Well, from that moment on, the discipleship journey begins for that person. Well, how are you gonna disciple them? 
easiest thing in the world to disciple them because we have all these amazing discipleship opportunities in place. It's a huge core value of the church to create uh, an environment, a culture organically of discipleship. It's so awesome. So you just compel them to go with you to church. It's that simple. When we get the growth groups going in January again for the next semester, compel them to come to the growth group. Compel them to come to church. Compel them to come to the next men's breakfast and fellowship or women's breakfast and fellowship. There's different entries into the kingdom of God through New Vintage Church, isn't there? Compel the, I love that word compel. Where did I get that from? Well, in some Bible versions, the word compel is used in Luke chapter 14. This is so interesting. This parable of the great banquet. All right. So Jesus shares this parable about a master who puts together this really incredible party. And this, he's talking about the kingdom of God. He's not talking about some future, you know, heaven. It could be interpreted in that context, but I want to focus on this particular context. Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. That's, we're eating at the feast right now. It's really incredible. So Jesus launches into this parable and of a master who is uh, inviting people to his feast, to his extravagant party. And many guests were invited, and he says to the servant, go tell all the guests, come, everything is now ready. And they all begin to make excuses. I just bought a field. Uh, please excuse me. I just bought five yoke of oxen. Please excuse me. I just got married. I can't come. I can't come into this great, this great party. The servant came and reported this back to his master. The owner of the house became very angry at the nation Israel for rejecting the Messiah. That's what the specific uh, uh, interpretation of this is. Yet, wow, to be able to look at this, realizing that the kingdom of God is here and in our midst, and we invite people and they have excuses, don't they? Like, well, I, I, I can't be involved in church at this point in my life. And for whatever reason, the servant comes back. He reports this to the master. The owner of the house becomes angry. He orders his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the alleys of town. Bring in the poor, those who are poor in spirit. Bring in the crippled, the blind, those who are spiritually blind. Bring in the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. And here's what I'm building up to. The master tells his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in. Make them come in. <laughs> Compel them. You should have that sense of urgency in your spirit. Compel your unsaved people to come in to the kingdom of God, to this amazing party. And there is still room. So make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. That's in direct relation to the nation who rejected the Messiah. And that's by God's sovereign will because then the gospel was made available to all the Gentiles in the whole world as a result. So I digress. You get the point. Tip one, pray. Tip two, be a peculiar person. Tip three, include Jesus in daily conversations. Tip four, compel them to go with you to church. And the above four tips provide a great description of what it's like to be working in a field of souls. And by doing so, you can no longer relate to that statement. There's got to be more to life. Praise God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this super awesome meaty uh, meal that you provided us, this incredible feast. 
And I pray that we would, to go out into our highways and byways, to the various fields that you have sovereignly placed us in for an eternal purpose. And that is to pray for our unsaved people and to represent you well and to compel them to come in. Father God, thank you for sealing this work that you performed in our hearts and minds. And we just thank you so much for choosing us to partake in this incredible eternal mission, a rescue mission. So use us, Lord, and bless us as we desire above all other desires to bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, just a couple of really quick announcements.